Palo Alto, California. It's The Cube at Pier 2.0. Brought to you by the Pier 2.0 Foundations. Learn, connect, and grow. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Welcome back, Jeff Frick here at the Pier 2.0 Foundation event in Palo Alto, California. We're with theCUBE, we go out to the events, we extract a signal from the noise, we get the smartest people in the room we can find, we invite them on theCUBE to ask them the questions that you'd like to ask them. And I'm joined for our next segment here with Bill Norton, Chief Strategy Officer for IAX. Bill, welcome to theCUBE. Hi. So Bill shows up with a book, let's, let's jump right out. We love when people bring uh, books on theCUBE, we've launched companies, we've launched books, we've launched all kinds of stuff. So what do you got there? The Internet Peering Playbook, written by the one and only, yeah. Bill Norton. <laughs> yeah, well this started out actually as a whole series of white papers. When I first started working at Equinix back in the day, one of the things I wanted to do was find out what is this peering stuff, what are exchange points, how does all that work? And not just from the high level perspective, but from an actual internet service provider and network operator perspective. So I went to internet conferences all over the world and I asked basic questions like that. So what is the definition of peering that you guys use? When you decide to peer with somebody, why would you say yes? And when you don't want to peer with somebody, why would you say no? And I would document what they said in the form of a white paper. And then I would walk the next people through the white paper that the previous people had contributed to. And they would say, well, you know, we think of peering a little bit differently. We tend to uh, focus more on the quantifiable business case for peering or what have you. And I would make modifications to the white paper. And after about 100 walkthroughs of the white paper at an internet operations event, I would have in my hand a white paper that represented the community mindset on a previously undocumented internet operations activity. So let's talk a little bit about, about to, the, to the folks that aren't necessarily completely up to speed on networking, right? Because we get kind of a broad, a broad audience out there. What is kind of peering 101 for the person just coming off the street saying, tell me, what, the, what is this and why is it important? Absolutely. So to answer that question, I guess I would start by saying that most people buy access to the internet using a service called Internet Transit. Internet Transit is a port on the wall that says, internet this way. You simply send your traffic to your internet service provider, maybe it's Comcast or AT&T or somebody else, and you just send all of your traffic out that way and they take care of absolutely everything. I call that connecting to the edge of the internet. And there's nothing wrong with that. 99.99% .99 of all internet attachments are at the edge. But if you look at the largest, most successful content companies or networks in the world, they connect to the core of the internet, which are these internet exchange points, the place where all of these network operators congregate and exchange traffic with one, uh, one another. And in that way, the traffic that is going ultimately between my network and your network is going directly between our two networks and not up through your upstream ISP for which you pay. So that's the PAX, right? The Palo Alto Exchange, I think, is one of the The PAX the is a great ones. example of an internet exchange point, absolutely. Okay, so peering is the direct connection from exchange point to exchange point. No, uh, no. direct connection between not even do the network exchange? operators. Okay. The network operators are the ones who exchange traffic. The internet exchange point is the, uh, the facilitator of that exchange. Okay, so it seems like a pretty simple concept, yep. and yet you went out and asked a whole bunch of people yeah. to get their definition of what peering was and why was it important. Talk a little bit about kind of different points of views that you uncovered in your, in your search and what are some of the real important items that people really need to understand about peering? Well, there's a, um, peering used to be a process that was primarily used by the largest ISPs in the world. So AT&T customers need to get direct access to Sprint customers who might need to access Quest customers and so forth. So there's a, a, a mesh of these large ISPs in the world that exchange traffic with one another. And that used to be primarily the domain for internet peering. But then the tier two ISPs, the smaller guys, found that they too could exchange traffic with one another. And by doing so, they bypass the tier one ISPs, at least for that traffic that can be directly exchanged. Um, so I started studying the internet as an ecosystem because the tier one ISPs 
acted fundamentally different from the Tier 2 ISPs. The Tier 1 ISPs are defined as ISPs that have access to the entire country solely through their free and reciprocal peering arrangements. So they don't have to pay transit fees to anyone to reach any destination within the country. The Tier 2 ISPs are everybody else. Those are the guys who have to pay transit fees to somebody to reach some destination within the country. And therefore, they're motivated to peer their traffic directly with each other to bypass the Tier 1 ISPs, at least for that subset of traffic between their two customer bases. So I started finding that there are different species inside the ecosystems, Tier 1 ISPs, Tier 2 ISPs, and content providers, and they each act differently. But what's interesting is around the world, Jeff, every internet peering ecosystem I've studied has the exact same type of structure. The names might be different, you know, in Singapore it might be uh, Singtel and Pacific Internet and, you know, another ISP, where in the U.S. it's Tier 1 ISPs or Quest and Level 3 and actually it's CenturyLink now, but uh, uh, AT&T and so forth. So the different uh, names of the specific companies, but the context in every ecosystem around the world is very, very similar. From a technological point of view, yes, but we just we just had our last segment talking about how different kind of the the, the opportunity for say the consumer internet options in the UK are so vastly different than they are here. So talk a little bit about how things evolved over time in terms of consolidation and expansion and choices for entry points into this ecosystem. Well, I think if you look at the ecosystem from you know. Uh, um, uh, you know, a mile away, you see that the, the interdependencies between the different players um, is, is really, really quite strong. The tier one ISPs pair with each other, tier two ISPs pair with each other, and the content companies buy transit from the tier two ISPs and the tier one ISPs. Um, what you tend to see in the evolution of the ecosystem is that you do see a lot more choices coming into the ecosystem. The cable companies once were underneath the auspices of at home at home would handle all the internet uh, activities for all the cable companies. But they went bankrupt in 2001, That's right. and all the cable companies had to instantly become ISPs. Initially, all the cable companies across the United States would peer with each other for free and get access directly to each other's eyeballs. And in, in that way, uh, those guys had really quite good uh, performance and they reduced their costs as well. And then the large scale network savvy content providers like Yahoo and Google started evolving into these peering beings. They're a new species entered the ecosystem and they started peering with the cable companies. So now all of a sudden the quality of the experience that end customers had got fundamentally better because Yahoo is literally directly connected to the cable companies' networks. And the amount of uh, capacity and performance, the lower latency, the lower packet loss, all meant that end users got a much better experience. And where's the investment coming in when you've got kind of this interconnected play of mutually beneficial relationships, uh -huh. but still someone's got to, got to invest in infrastructure, they got to invest in, in pipes and switches and data centers, et cetera. Yeah. Is, is there kind of a, uh, you know, let's all do this together because it's greater and you know, it'll be a one plus one plus three, or you know, how has the, the kind of forces of who's got the influence morphed back and forth as it's uh, evolved from you know, mom and pop cable operators to more powerful cable operators to content providers, and then of course now it's the, it's the whole Netflix, Comcast uh, uh, flash, if you will, that's really causing a lot of, of conversation around this topic. One of the things I find fascinating, Jeff, is if you, if you look at these different species of players, they have really different motivations for, for peering and interconnecting. So if you look at the content companies, you talk to LinkedIn, we had LinkedIn give a great talk today about their motivation for, for peering and some of the automation they've done for, for peering. Every single content provider in the world that I've I've worked with and I've studied this, um, they will peer to improve the end user experience. Number one, it's not to save money, they might actually save a lot of money by doing it, but it's to improve the end user experience. And they're willing to invest an enormous amount of money in building out a global, large capacity network backbone solely 
so they have a better end user experience for the portal. They don't want someone to go to their competitor site. They know that if the, uh, if the glass, the, the, the visible part of your phone, if it doesn't fill up within a second or two, people will go to an alternative site. And this is really the content provider this you're talking content. about, the application provider. Absolutely. Okay. Universally, content providers want to peer to improve the end user speed, experience. Speed, 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 right? I mean, they got to get the stuff there quickly, it, as you said. You get that screen up there, get those ads. If they don't get those ads up there, people can't click on them, they lose money. Right, right. But the ISPs, they participate in peering for a different reason. As I said, the tier two ISPs, they peer with each other to reduce the amount of traffic. They have to pay AT&T to deliver. They can optimize their traffic directly. For them, it's not about the end user experience. It's about the cost savings of not having to have that transit meter spin really quickly. Right. Right. So it's interesting, there's different motivations for each of the players in the ecosystem. The tier one ISPs, they already have access to the entire country's routing table for free. They, they peer with each other and get access to the entire routing table. So they're peering because they need that connectivity amongst themselves to get access to that, that ecosystem. It's not to save money, it's not to improve the end user performance, it's because they need the global connectivity uh, in particular, the connectivity within that uh, region. So then you throw in the explosion of content creation right. with all the apps and music and movies and everything else now coming down, which, which is probably much bigger, not to mention enterprise usage or Internet of Things uh, and big data. Yeah. And then you have an explosion of, of consumption devices on the other end. So huge, huge bump up in demand. Um, how are the carriers dealing with that in terms of it, it's spinning their it's spinning their little dial faster, as you as you said? Yeah, you know, w one of the things that was most interesting is I started working with um, with YouTube uh, way back when they first started getting into this stuff, and the amount of traffic they were pushing was starting to grow exponentially. And what was fascinating to witness at that time, if you remember back then, if you'd see video uh, on the internet, you'd see a little postage stamp. A very jittery type of screen, right, uh, right. A, a video, and it just was not a very uh, good, high quality experience. There's a, a graph in, in, in the book called the video suckiness curve. <laughs> and way back then, the video suckiness curve showed the little postage stamp up there, and it just didn't work very well. But as you started seeing Doxus uh, being deployed in the last mile, that opened up the pipes very big in the last mile. When you started looking on the content creation side, you know, it wasn't that long ago that digital cameras came out where you could take a large amount of video and then connect to your Mac and have it brought into iMovie or something like that and spew that out right to, right to YouTube. Right. So the flow the, from the end systems that created the content all the way up to, to YouTube and the massive distribution system that YouTube used to get that out there all the way to the broadband, that video internet ecosystem, as I call it, from end to end was finally activated. And yes, at that point, you started seeing the transit meters spinning faster. You started seeing enormous amounts of content being distributed using CDNs and transit and peering. And uh, it was incredibly exciting and incredibly powerful for the peering ecosystem. Those pipes got very, very fat very fast. And how is it financed? Well, um, YouTube is now financed by, uh, by ads. Um, you know, but back then, back then uh, they were just running, uh, running a lot of data, right? They didn't have a lot of revenue. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't a lot of ads. Well, they, did, Silicon they, Valley. they didn't have the, the, big <laughs> Google, uh, the big Google cash machine supporting them. Um, yeah. So what, who was financing this massive uh, increase in demand on the infrastructure? The, the, the one um, data point I remember hearing was that if Google didn't acquire YouTube within six months, YouTube would be out of business. They would have simply run out of money, but instead they had that $1.65 billion buyout because of the, the user base and right. because of the uh, the, the growth and the value of that brand. Well, what a what what a amigo deal steal that was. Uh, looking back in hindsight, for 1.6 billion dollars, it seems pretty inexpensive Holy compared cow. to some of the transactions that we're getting but today. Back then, that was that was a it big, was a big number of traffic for for virtually no revenue. Right, they're really yeah. buying the future. So, so in, in my position, you know, um, I was the. Uh, um, I served as co-founder and chief technical liaison for Equinix. So my job was to travel to different conferences around the world, to study the ecosystems, to study how things were working, to hear what people were saying about Equinix, to hear what people were saying about other companies, our competitors, and to find out what opportunities existed in the marketplace and how things were dynamically shifting. 
During the time we just spoke about, during the video internet uh, evolution, it was a phenomenally fun time to be in the ecosystem. Because the more traffic that goes across the interfering ecosystem, the more traffic that people can peer away for free, the more desirable the exchange points are, because that's where you can offload your traffic for free with one another, and that just sends everything up just higher and higher and higher. And of course, the, the flip side of that is that also meant that people could charge less and less and less for internet transit, and we saw the price of internet transit go from $1,200 per megabit per second in 1998. Five years later, it was $120 per megabit per second. Five years later, it was $12 per megabit per second. And today, it's $1.20 per megabit per second. If you follow that trajectory, in you know, just a few more years, it'll be 12 cents per uh, megabit per second. Essentially free, right? Yeah. Essentially asymptotically approaching zero, and, and Moore's Law wins again. Exactly um, right, exactly right. So here we are at Pier 2.0, yeah. first time uh, for this event. What's, what's Pier 2.0 all about in the context of the story in which you just told, and, and, and what does it really set, us, set the path for uh, for the next several years? Yeah, well, you know, there are lots of forums around the internet operations space now. Every region around the world has their own internet operations forum. In North America, it's NANOG, a, a group that I used to chair. Um, called the North American Network Operators Group. In Europe, it's a French acronym um, pronounced RIPE, and that's where they have their coordination. Uh, in uh, Asia, there's a once-a-year conference called APRICOT, and these are places where people come to, uh, to talk about internet operations the topics in general. Um, those do a really fine job. There's also uh, a variety of peering forums, like the Global Peering Forum, or the European Peering Forum, or the Asia Peering Forum. And these are places for peering coordinators to meet one another, schedule meetings to discuss whether it makes sense for you and I to connect our networks together and peer. If there's about equal value, the answer is yes. If there isn't, the answer is probably no. Um, but Peer 2.0 is not that. We're not trying to be an internet operations forum. We're not trying to be a peering forum. This is an educational forum. This is a place where experienced peering people can share their experience, to share their expertise with the folks who are just starting to get into the peering ecosystem. And if we do this right, we can grow the peering ecosystem well beyond the well-established tier two ISPs, well beyond the well-established content companies, and include enterprises like Hertz, and Avis, and Visa, and MasterCard, all these guys ought to be peering directly. Amongst themselves. Well, amongst themselves and directly with their key trading partners. And if we do this right, we can grow this ecosystem in order of magnitude larger, and everyone's going to benefit from that. So are there, are there technological hurdles to that happening, or is it more just kind of a point of view and, and just kind of the evolution as to is, is that kind of the yeah. natural state of the evolution of where it would go based on you know, the steps that we've already taken? It's an education thing. Okay. I mean, if you're a content company, you're most likely buying transit. Like I said, it's a simple service. It says internet this way, you just send your traffic to AT&T or Sprint or whoever, and your traffic gets out there. You may not even have a network engineering team to know enough to know that you could also connect to the core of the internet and be directly connected to Box or Dropbox, or Microsoft, or, or whoever. Or whoever, right. Uh, so you need to understand that that opportunity exists, and it doesn't mean you need to build out a large network. You don't need a large networking staff to do this anymore. It can be done you know, very quickly and very easily, and that's one of the things that I'm sure you learned that IIX is involved in doing. Did, um, do you think that that path will go down kind of a trading partner set, or more likely uh, an industry set, or you know, kind yeah. of, what do you think kind of the natural bundles of, of activity and, and connectivity will be as it evolves? You know, is it, yeah. is it Hertz plus Sheridan plus Alaska Airlines, or is it Alaska plus United plus Southwest? I mean, how, how is this going to evolve, do you think? Well, so here's where I see things going. Um, today, folks are buying transit, and they're blending in some amount of peering. So they can still buy transit from AT&T to reach the entire internet, but you know what? A lot of my traffic that I care about is coming from Box. We're using Box, for example, as our, our shared data store for our companies. Mission critical that we have direct access to Box. 
So we're going to peer with Even box. though it's probably shadow IT and nobody knows it's there, but that's a different conversation <laughs> for another show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're going to um, peer with box. We've uh, certified. So the point is that there's going to be a blend. Right. So you're going to buy transit, but you're also going to peer some with key trading partners. Andreas Sturm from the DKX once told me, important traffic is peered. And I love that phrase, important traffic is peered. That means if you like, you can be directly connected to those key partners where you exchange a lot of traffic. Most likely, if you're a content company, you want to be directly connected to Google for Google Ads. If you're an enterprise, you want to be directly connected to Microsoft and Dropbox and other key trading partners. And it's going to be that kind of blend. You're going to blend in transit, peering, remote peering, which, which IAX offers, distributed peering, which is another thing that IAX is, is doing, um, CDN services, and then the question is, what is the optimal blend for the network application at hand? And there are a variety of different views on that. So the point is, you've got a much broader toolkit now available than you did four or five years ago. You did before. So Bill, we're getting the hook on time. I oh. want to give you the last word. Um, your book was a collection of notes from a tour before. What's the next book going to be on? What's kind of the next kind of big thing that you're looking at from kind of a macro point of view? Oh, I'm not really looking at doing another another book. Um, in theory, um, there there are a lot of interesting topics though coming forward. For example, this this edition of the book has a focus on international peering, something that hasn't been documented before. Okay. So when I started working a lot across Africa, places like South Africa and Kenya and Ghana, Nigeria and such, I learned that there's actually a, a whole lot of interesting gamesmanship about how you decide what country to go into, and when you go into that country, do you buy transit, do you peer, do you do you, uh, sell transit, um, what are the different models for doing that? And it kind of fits into that blend future projection as well. Um, so I might expand the international footprint focus and evolve this book to uh, the 2015 edition. Awesome, well you gotta, gotta keep adding to it. So Bill, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Bill Norton, Chief Strategy Officer for IAX. I'm Jeff Frick with theCUBE. We're at the Peer 2.0 Foundation event in Palo Alto, California. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thanks for watching.